Welcome to another episode of 30 Minutes with DailyStraits.com. This is your host, June Rumley. Our guest today is Gavin Oliver, one of the founders of EcoZip. Established in 2012, EcoZip is an adventure and ecotourism company designed to get visitors out of tour buses and into the bush. The company was built on the concept of commercial conservation, or the belief that profit doesn't necessarily need to be the sole reason to be in business. So today we're going to speak to Gavin about uh, who is one of the originators of the business on why he decided to be a part of the venture and how tourism businesses such as his make a buck. Hello, Gavin. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Junior. Th nice, to, nice to speak to you. Great. Uh, let's dive right into the question. So um, you migrated to New Zealand from uh, the UK in 20, uh, 2008 with an entrepreneur visa and met a Texan guide and started EcoZip. So I'm just curious to know why did you choose uh, such a business? Well, I, it, Jenny, it wasn't a deliberate decision. So in 2008, I, I'd, I'd spent 25 years in, in, in you know, what we kind of call the corporate rat race. And I worked for a big corporate company. And, and so my customers were banks and hedge funds and financial services companies. And I, I felt, I really genuinely felt there had to be more to life than the, than the daily commute. Um, and by luck, um, by good fortune, I spent some time in New Zealand and fell in love with the country. And I just decided, I thought, well, this, this would be a lovely place to live. So we, we up sticks without really too much of a plan uh, and ended up here in 2008 on an entrepreneur class visa. Um, and the, and the, the thing with an entrepreneur class visa is you, essentially the New Zealand government trusts you and they give you two years to create a, a new business and, and obviously create some jobs and, and start paying some tax, create some GST payments and so on and so forth. And if you do that, they let you stay. But, um, but sadly, if you don't hit those targets, they, they, they'll show you the door. So it was a, it was a really interesting process. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So there was an article that you recently wrote and you actually said that it was because of a, a detour you did from Dubai, right? You went to Dubai for work and then you did a five days detour. So before that, have you ever been to New Zealand? No, before that no, no, no All I right. I'd spent, yeah, I spent no time in New Zealand. I'd always had a hankering to come here, but I'd never been here. And I, I spent five magical days here. Um, and I quite literally fell in love with the country and I, I, I went home. And um, it's a great story, but on the, on the first day that I commuted, I was commuting into central London and, uh, and, and I and I'd traveled through New Zealand and I'd seen some of the fantastic countryside. And I'd had this experience standing on this transalpine train, crossing these braided rivers and looking at people fly fishing. And I just, and it was idyllic. It was it was summer and it was, it was warm and peaceful. And anyway, so I go back to London and, and, and you, you know, the, the, the underground is packed full of people. And on my first day back, I was stuck in some guy's armpit. You know, the guy was holding onto the leather strap and I was stuck in the guy's armpit. And above the door, there was an advert for Tourism New Zealand. And it said, wouldn't you rather be here? And I thought, yeah, hell yes. <laughs> and, uh, and <laughs> so you were running a business or were you in a real job and you quit and then packed up and sold your house? Did yeah, you so I was, no, I was, I was a partner in a, in a corporate travel agency. I got two business partners. And I, so I told the boys that I wanted to leave. But I, I went to my wife and I said, hey, look, I think we should emigrate to New Zealand. And she, fortunately, she said yes. She didn't think I was nuts. And she said yes. And, and so we made the decision to go. So we sold our share in the company. We sold the house. We sold the cars. We liquidated absolutely everything. All our belongings ended up in a 40-foot shipping container. And we moved to the other side of the world, not really sure what we were going to do. With, with one child under two, and at the time we departed, we suddenly realized we got another one on the way. So when we arrived, my wife was 20 weeks pregnant. So it's kind of madness um, to do that, just to, you know, but, but we did it and, you know, you know, it's 12 years later. Yeah, so you didn't know a single soul in New Zealand? Oh, uh, no, okay. I got a sister living here, but I, so we, we live, but we, but I, yeah, that was it. Well, we knew one person. All righty. Okay, so then you came to New Zealand and you met this Texan guy, right, who happened to be your business partner in Echo Zip. So apparently it said that you went for some camping trips and you met him over beer. Is that right? Yeah, so so the, so I when I first arrived in New Zealand, I joined a hiking club. In New Zealand, it's known as tramping. You go tramping. So I joined this tramping club, and I met this lovely guy called Peter Brown. And Peter said to me, hey, I know this mad Texan, and I think you two might hit it off. 
And, and he was right. He was obviously a great judge of people. And so Peter introduced me to Chris and Chris and I got on like a house on fire from the get go. And we were, because he's from Texas and I was from the UK and we were, the, the, the motivational kind of the inspiration was the same. So that here's this beautiful part of the country that, that you know, the fringes of Auckland are beautiful. Um, yet so many visitors came here and they would jump on buses and they'd go off to Rotorua or they'd jump on planes and they'd fly to South Island. And we thought, well, hang on a minute, what could we do that would get people out exploring, you know, the region? Um, and, and, and that was really where it started. So that, that, and the inspiration was, you know, we, we said, what could we do that would get people off tour buses and into the bush, into the native forest? And so, and that's where it started. And it was, and we, we, in addition to a love of hiking, we both share a love of craft beer. And, and, and so we would meet on a Thursday night at a bar and, and, and throw mad ideas around. And one night Chris walked into the bar and said, what about zip lines? And I, I had no idea what a zip line was. And, I, and, he, and he said, oh, it's a steel cable, you know, you hang off the steel. And I said, that sounds dangerous. And he said, no, that's no, great fun. And so we, so the next thing, you know, this, this pair of buffoons that know nothing about adventure tourism are riding zip lines in all sorts of places and, 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 and learning about them. Okay, so what was Peter doing in um, New Zealand? Was he also on an entrepreneur visa with you or was he in a job? No, no, Peter, Peter, was, a, a, Peter was a 70 year old Kiwi. He, he'd been a, an entrepreneur in his own right. He was pretty much retired. Um, and he, he met me through tramping and Chris through, um, through golf. And so he was just, oh. he was just, he happened, it was lucky circumstance, Jim. It was just, it, uh, he happened to put us both in the right place at the right time. And what about Chris? What was he doing there? Was he there before you? Like how many years had he been in mm. New Zealand? Yeah, he arrived in 2006 with his wife and his two daughters and they, they were living, uh, they were actually living on Waiheke Island. Um, and he'd had a very successful career in the senior living and retirement community sector. He'd been a, a pioneer of a thing called assisted living. Um, and he was sort of, I kind of, you guess you'd call it semi-retired. He was enjoying a, a fairly relaxed lifestyle. And I don't think he was looking for a new venture when we met, but we, um, we kind of spurred each other on. All right. So, um, okay. So why um, did you guys decide to do this business together? What was the the spark that made it happen yeah look, i think the inspiration for us is it, it's 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 both as we got older and our, and our kids have grown up i think we've become more and more aware of, of kind of what kind of legacy you leave as, a, as an entrepreneur or a business owner um and for a long time i i've wondered you know what will my kids say to my kids about me as a business owner and, and, and what i achieved um and we really felt very very strongly that there was an opportunity to get into tourism that had a commercial we called it commercial conservation so that the, the concept that you can take a commercial operation um, and use that as a vehicle to fund restoration uh, and regeneration um and you obviously you and your listeners will have heard a lot about sustainable tourism but we you know we, we're now talking about regenerative tourism we're talking about tourism that's 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 actually is leaving a positive byproduct so it's not just about maintaining the status quo it's actually about improving the environment and improving the, the, the lives of our communities through tourism and that that was what excited us um, and zip lines seem to be a, a fairly natural way of doing that so money was not the motivation it was more to help the environment right yeah, look, money's it's money always, you know, we, we've all got mortgages. Um, and you know, but but no, it wasn't money. It was we we for us it really was about a legacy, um, or it started with that idea that and, and we 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 acquired this piece of land out on Waiheke Island, which is a, a, a beautiful piece of a of, of very old native forest, about six or seven hundred years old, and it was in a real state. Um, it was full of invasive um weed and pest species. Um and we realized that we could use the, the zip line business as a way of restoring this to its, its, its former glory. Um, and the Māori people talk about um, a, a, a process of kaitiakitanga, which, kaitiakitanga which, which essentially means guardianship. It's that acceptance that we're not owners of the land, we're just trustees. Um, and we have a responsibility to, to hand that land on in a better state than when we acquired it. Um, and it's a very, you know, for, for a very ancient concept, it's a very far thinking idea. And, and, and we kind of incorporated that into the business. Alrighty. Can you tell me how did you overcome trust issues starting a business with a stranger? Because a lot of people would rather do business with their family or a friend that they've known from um, from the childhood. But, you know, this guy is a Texan. He's not even the same nationality as you and you <laughs> went into a business with him. So did you 
is there an ironclad contract that you crafted out before going to business with him? And um, what are the things that you um, do? If Did you ever think that if it goes south, what would some of the methods, I mean, the, the kind of um, things that you might take to mitigate the situation? I think part of it, so there's two phases to that process, Jim. There's the first phase is the leap of trust, which is, you know, to, to say, I'm going to get into business with someone that I don't really know, and particularly to get into an industry that I don't know, because I've got no background in adventure, I've got no background in tourism, and, and nor had Chris. So to take a chance on each other requires a leap of a leap of faith. Um, there is there are there are some um, that there's some legal recourse that you've got because obviously when you form a limited company here, um, you have articles and you're the sh shareholders agreements, and and there are things that that bind your behaviour towards one another and bind your behavior within the company. But that first point at which you make the decision, I'm gonna start investing my time uh, and, and my personal money in, in researching a venture. There's no, there's no legal way of tying that down. I think you just have to, it's a decision you have to make. And I, I spent a lot of time with Chris um, and, uh, and I, I spoke to people that knew it and I couldn't find anyone that had got anything bad to say about him, and I did. I did quite a bit of research, um, and, the, and and the feedback that kept coming through every time I spoke to anyone about Chris, they said this is a guy that does what he says he will do, um, and it and it and it became pretty clear that this was a, a very principled guy, um, and you know, twelve years later, I've, I've I would I've never had a moment to to doubt that relationship, and it, and he and but it is a, it's a leap of faith at first. So did you do any special contract? Like, did you guys talk out, trash things out? Like, okay, if we fall out, what happens? Did you do some serious No, we, no we didn't. We, 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 had a, we had a legally binding contract. So well, we had a contract as far as we had, you know, for the company that the articles of association and so on and so forth that require that, that bind how we manage the company. But no, there was never a point at which we said, you know, we, we, if, we, if we fall out, we're not going to do this. The, the, probably the most... The closest we've ever come to that was a discussion we had a few years in when we were talking about the future and, and, and actually developing another site. And we kind of reached an agreement, which was, we'll do this for as long as we enjoy it. And when we stop enjoying it, we'll stop doing it. Oh. And, and it's kind of an, and, and that was a handshake agreement. So there's no piece of paper. <laughs> That's really lucky. You're lucky. Um, so it took a, your business four years to reach commercial success instead of the two, right? So um, I was just wondering, with this entrepreneur visa in New Zealand, are you allowed to take desk bound jobs to pay the bills? Because when you're doing a business, you know, there's a lot of outgoing and then uh, it takes a few months or sometimes years to break even and a few more years to make profit. So what was your plan? How did you Come up, um, like yeah. What did you do? Yeah, but by the time we set up EcoZip, I'd, I'd, I'd managed. To, I'd, I'd already proven to to the government that I was worthy of, of permanent residency. So by the time we set up EcoZip, I was I was kind of safe. But you still had that process. You know, we thought we'd get the business into profit in two years, and it took us nearer four. And there were some very pregnant pauses. You know, when we'd sit there and sort of we'd scratch our heads, and occasionally we 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 articulate. You know, whether whether we'd made a terrible mistake, had, had we got it all wrong. Um, and we were both, you know, and particularly me, we were, we were living on our savings, we were living on our investments, and um, but we could we could see the potential, um, and we knew it was coming. It was just a question of keeping faith, really. Um, but it's tough. It's tough times, and particularly when you've got a young family, um, that you you just yeah. I mean, we I was fortunate enough to have the savings to enable me to do that, and and but no, so I didn't need to take another job. I wasn't I wasn't you know waiting tables or, or, or cleaning up in McDonald's. And I know the story that's, that, that's, that's typical of many entrepreneurs. But okay, um, can you do it though? Uh, does the visa allow you to work? No. no. What about your wife? Can You're, she work? Yeah. Well, she, can, she was allowed to work. Um, but bear in mind, we got two small kids at this point. Um, so oh. Liz's ability to work was, was somewhat curtailed. Um, so oh. it was... Sorry, sorry, I sorry to interrupt. Okay. So that means your the one that's the the property that you liquidated from the UK and every all the share, the money, it helped you during those times, right? Yeah, that's right. That's what we were spending. We were living off. We essentially we taken the, the last I don't know twenty years of our lives. We liquidated it, and we were we were you know we were living off the last twenty years of of prudence. Did you ever in those 
four years, ever think like, oh my God, have I done a mistake or is this worth it? <laughs> yeah, frequently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are, of course, if you don't have moments of self-doubt, um, I, I, I'd be amazed. Any, anyone that starts a business and doesn't tell you that at some point they wonder if they've massively miscalculated, I'd, I'd be, I, I, I would admire them, but I'd also, I'd find that amazing because you do. I mean, there are moments of self-doubt in, in anything like this and, um, I, you know, and, it, it, and there are highs and lows, but then you have these little wins and you suddenly think, well, yeah, actually, you know, we did, you know, we, we have done something right. And then when, once it, you know, once it lurched into that sort of end of the third year, start the fourth year, and we, we could see where it was going. Um, at, at, at that point, you know, you relax finally. Okay. All right. Um, so you said just now you didn't know anything about zip lines and then you still went ahead with Chris. Chris, Chris suggested this business to you, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. and you went ahead. Um, did it ever come across, uh, across your mind if there was, were consequences, like if your customer would have got into a nasty fall, there would be a lot of ramification, like a lawsuit. Um, so how did you talk yourself out of this fear? Um, the, the New Zealand safety environment is probably um, amongst the best in the world. We, we have a, a, a mandatory uh, safety system here called the Adventure Tourism Regulation. So. Uh, adventure tourism operators here are required to be registered with the government and then we're regularly audited on our safety systems policies and procedures um, and so it's one of, and, and one of the great things about the way that the New Zealand government did this they, they actually engaged with industry to do it so the, the, the standards were written in collaboration with the sector so we had those things so, we, so we're regularly audited so you have to have faith in your safety systems and you have to have faith in your people. Um, and that's really the key, the key thing for us is that we, we have a very robust health and safety system um, and, we, and, it's, and it's regularly tested. Um, and then there's an external test, but, it, but you have to know that you're operating at, a, at, a, at 110%. You, you, you can never relax where safety is concerned because you know, in, a, in, a, in a moment's inattention is, is when something really awful can happen. Okay, so did you like uh, do you did you and Chris do a business plan, <laughs> and then you did okay, and also you did all the um what ifs what ifs lawsuit did you put lawsuit, you know they they usually budget did you budget anything for lawsuits? Um no we didn't um we we rather <laughs> hoped we wouldn't run into one of those um New Zealand is interesting um you you can't be sued for uh, personal injury in New Zealand. Um, so uh, that's one of the one of the things that, um, that that businesses here don't have to contend with. Um, so, but it, but there's still that doesn't lessen your obligation to comply with the appropriate health and safety regulations. As a business owner, if you get it wrong, you can be in a you personally can be in an awful lot of trouble. So we didn't we didn't leg or we didn't allow for lawsuits. But the, the business plan, I guess, we we worked it out at some point that we think we put about three thousand hours of research into the business. Um, and into developing multiple budgets um, and multiple scenarios. Um, and those things, as, as your listeners will know, they're, they're really movable feasts, they're dynamic, and they, they change on an almost weekly basis in, 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 as, as, as new opportunities arise or new issues come to light. So, so there was a business plan. Um, we were probably a bit optimistic on some of the timelines, on how fast we'd, we'd hit some of the timelines in there. Uh, but yeah, there was a, a very detailed plan behind the business. Okay, so were, this, were there any changes every year or did you like just did it once and then forget about it? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a dynamic thing. A business plan always needs to be a dynamic thing and it's something that changes constantly. Um, and so there, there, were, there were milestones that we set for ourselves that we didn't achieve and we then back, went back and reviewed those milestones and we, and we were really honest with ourselves about what, what we needed to do to, uh, in order to, to, you know, to, to make those, you know, to get to those, those points that we needed to get to. Awesome. How much did you and Chris uh, invest cash wise um, um, in the business, if you don't mind sharing? Um, well, it, was, it, was, it was a fairly significant investment. The, um, the, the, the build um, and the land and so on and so forth um, is valued um, over five million dollars, uh, five million New Zealand dollars. So it was a fairly significant investment. OK, so it's 50 50, you and Chris. Yep, we're 50 50 partners in the business today. Uh, Chris, All right. Um, and we've it's a it's a look it's a hybrid structure and i won't bore you or your listeners with the, how the structure works but yeah so and and we jokingly say that chris is the brains and i'm the talent <laughs> 
So um, I just want to take you back a bit. You didn't like look at other businesses which had a cheaper uh, entry point. Um, we did look at, yeah, we did look at acquisitions. Um, we, we had a, a fairly broad look at the market, but at that point, so back in 2010, when we first started thinking about this, there was only one commercial zip line in New Zealand. Um, and the research that we'd done, and I mentioned that we'd done about 3000 hours, the research that we'd done suggested that it was a very ripe market here. There was a great opportunity and it, and it, and it really fitted perfectly, uh, with our, aspirations around commercial conservation this was a this was a, a sector that we could move into that wasn't already heavily populated um, and that was was prime for bringing a, a conservation element to it so it was so i don't think we ever wavered in our belief that it was the right thing to do i was curious to find out why you didn't think of doing bungee jumping um, it was already a, a very successful New Zealand operation doing bungee jumping, and there was and there's quite a few operations in New Zealand. So, really, what I think as a business owner for me, I I'm a, I, I want to grow the market. I don't want to I don't want to cannibalise the market. I wouldn't go and open, you know, a, a zipline business next door to you know one of my one of my colleagues. The, the other guys that own zipline businesses in New Zealand are my mates. You know, we we talk to each other all, on an almost weekly basis. I wouldn't go and open next door. I, I, I'd like to try and I, I'm interested in doing things that, in, that grow the market rather than cannibalize the market. OK, what are some of the downfalls of running a service based tourism business in New Zealand? Um, the borders can close. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so how do you how do you mitigate that? What what are you doing now? Well, look, when, Jim, when the borders, when, uh, at the point at which the borders closed, about 70% of our customers were international. Um, so obviously the impact on us was, was enormous and, and, and very immediate. Um, we literally felt it overnight. Um, and there's no playbook for that. I, I did an interview last year where, where the, the, the journalist asked me, how do you prepare for something like that? And I said, I don't think you can because there's, there's no, you know, there's no historical precedent in the tourism sector for this kind of thing. So you, you, you really are living by your wits. Um, and I'm very lucky that I work with a brilliant team of individuals. Um, and between us, um, from our operations manager to our site manager to the safety manager, the, the, all the, the whole team really, uh, right down to you know everyone, our zip line guides, our drivers, um, there was a real collaborative effort to think about, okay, well, how do we pivot this business? How do we move from where we traditionally were with 70% of our customers being international? How do we, how do we, how do we move and, and, and embrace a, a much more domestic audience? Um, and that's, that's been a learning, well, I say it's been a learning curve. I mean, it's a learning experience that hasn't stopped yet. We're still learning. We're, we're back, we're currently now running at about 75% of our pre-COVID visitor numbers. Um, we have seen a few Australians since the, the border to Australia opened, but it's largely domestic. So it's a, it, it remains a, 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 an uphill climb, um, but we, we've learned a lot about the business over the last 12 months. Okay, um, when you were doing the business, right, did you ever um, put in um, the SARS, the, uh, you know, the financial crisis and stuff like that? Was that, were they all in your business plan as part of the planning? Yeah, we, we, so I arrived in New Zealand at the teeth of the GFC in 2008. So that was very much on my mind. And, and, and Chris has a background in finance. So he, he and I were both acutely aware of that. I don't think we, we, we didn't necessarily think about things like SARS um, and pandemics were, were not the sort of issues. For us, the biggest challenges were around safety. Um, and for example, what might happen to our business if, if somebody in our sector had a terrible accident and what might we be, um, yeah, or might we be damaged or might we suffer as a result? So they were the kind of things we thought of. But I, I don't think anybody in the New Zealand tourism sector in, in 2010 and onwards was thinking about the effect of a, a global pandemic. Yeah, definitely. So now that, uh, so you said that you've gone back to 75%, it's mostly local tourists, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. so it's, it's predominantly domestic visitors, um, and we have um, a, there's a reasonably high number of uh, overseas visitors that are that are still in New Zealand and international students and so on and so forth that haven't been able to leave and and they're still travelling. But but also it's been a real um, from the middle of last year it became clear that that New Zealanders were really keen to get out and support. Um, tourism and hospitality businesses, there was a palpable, almost a, a, a sort of sense of camaraderie. 
um, when people got out and they supported and they asked continuing to support tourism business, hospo businesses, and, and the kind of businesses that have been affected by COVID-19. Um, and for us as a business, it was about how do we change our, our, our offering um, and, and appeal even more to those domestic customers. Okay, basically, right, um... After four years, you uh, broke even, and now you're you're this um you know making money. Okay, I just wanted to find out, right? Do you plan for uh, the future? Is this kind of your business, right? Do you plan ahead for to you know like pain points like now, like COVID, right? Do you, is that part of your planning? It is now, yeah. Look, and it will be. I mean, there's going to be a lot more facts that come onto the quite come onto the table as we think about the future of the business. We have another location in South Island that we we were due to open last year. We were going to break ground in uh, May of last year with, a, with the intention of carrying our first guests in October, November. Obviously, that project was put on ice because of COVID. Um, mm. How we think about that now and how we plan for that is going to change substantially. Um, and things like business interruption um, and that ability to, 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 to possibly cease operations for extended periods of time is going to, is going to feature quite largely in those plans. And that, that's not the sort of thing we thought about previously. Are you planning to pivot into a new offering soon, like completely different from Zipline? I mean, Zip, Echo Zip, sorry. Yeah, no, look, we, we, we talk about it. We, we, we constantly talk about it. Um, and, you know, should we do something else? And, and about a year ago, we did start looking at potential acquisitions. Um, obviously, COVID has put all of that on ice. Right now, the main focus is on um, we're, we're looking at adding some new activities to our Waiheke location and possibly adding food and beverage up there um, because it's a, it's a stunning site um, and it's an opportunity to potentially um, bring some, some new stuff to our existing customers. Um, and then there's, there's Kaikoura and the expansion into a second site down there. Um, and, and Kaikoura is, is a stunningly beautiful location. Um, with a, a fantastic marine tourism background. Um, and we think that a conservation focused tourism business there will, will, will fit really neatly sort of hand in glove. Awesome. Okay. And that is all the time that we have for today. We have just been speaking to Gavin Oliver, one of the co-founders of EcoZip. Thank you, Gavin, for joining us today. That's an absolute pleasure. And I, I, I hope you've, you found it interesting or at least useful. Yes, the pleasure is all ours. Be sure to catch our next episode where we feature another awesome entrepreneur from across the Tasman. Thank you.